John's a director at Camp Towingo uh, here in Ontario, Canada. Camp Towingo serves as a summer camp, outdoor center, private school, camp publisher, and consultant services in the camping industry. It's a really broad range of interests and capacity there. John's been giving leadership uh, symposia nationally and internationally for over 40 years in the areas of association work, conference keynotes, and workshop presentations. John's active board, uh, board and leadership involvement includes those of the Ontario Camps Association, the Canadian Camping Association, the Council of Outdoor Educators and International Camping Fellowship. He's the immediate past president of the ICF, the International Camping Fellowship. Jorgis tra traveled extensively to work with educators from a wide variety of camping or organizations across the world. He has authored uh, several books on camping and social recreation leadership. He lives in Huntsville, Muskoka with his wife, Barb, an educator in her own right. And so, John, Jorgi, over to you. So, uh, I too would like to make an acknowledgement for where I find myself now, uh, and uh, towards that end, um, I am in Huntsville, Muskoka, uh, on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe Ojibwa and Anishinaabe Chippewa, as well as uh, the Algonquin peoples, uh, all bound by the Williams Treaty, uh, the culmination of almost 200 years of uh, treaties and negotiations and promises. And uh, the reason, a second reason to give an acknowledgement now is that I wanted to uh, just reference treaties as promises, uh, as obligations, and that, uh, that treaty participants uh, take or share responsibility and care for the rights and freedoms of those who are bound by the treaty. And they also assume responsibility and care for the land in this case. And so I, I think it's significant and important that, that we uh, both acknowledge and also look to leaders uh, in the indigenous uh, communities for, for guidance in, in how to take that care. In my own journey uh, on, in the TRC, uh, one tradition I have uh, uh, admired and acknowledged and, and embraced uh, is that of knowing and clearly stating who we are uh, and where we come from. And uh, so towards that end, I'd like uh, to do the same. So we'll advance the slide to me. Um, I am a settler, a settler of three generations. My grand, my Norwegian grandfather and my, Norwe and my Swedish grandmother came to Saskatchewan uh, and uh, settled as farmers, moved to Manitoba. Second generation were farmers that moved into education and into community service. Uh, and the third generation, uh, educators and service to the community. One of my siblings went back to farming, actually. Um, I want you to know I never did learn to play the guitar, uh, but I grew up in privilege, uh, sheltered, uh, lots of outdoor activity, uh, scouting, uh, and then uh, pursued a degree in biology at the university. On the next slide, you'll see that I moved to camping through, uh, through international as well as local uh, uh, experiences. And my education in biology uh, steered into the area of microbiology in a basement laboratory for a year or two, but I realized I'd made a wrong turn and stepped back outdoors and have found my background very useful in, uh, in understanding uh, education in the outer doors. At uh, Camp Tuingo, I got involved in community service and that community service, as David outlined, uh, led me to the International Camping Fellowship and Global Travel. Uh, the next slide is, uh, I've turned my back to you there, but uh, uh, we all have, I think in our life, can, can touch on inflection points and uh, places where things changed. And for me, it changed in the middle of the 
Sahara Desert. Uh, I had been questioning my journey for a while and found myself with an opportunity to, to travel by a truck safari across the Sahara Desert uh, to Equatorial Africa. And it was there that uh, I found myself on the last day of the year, December 31st, uh, in the middle of the desert. And I took the opportunity to walk away in the darkness of the late evening and just prior to dawn. And as far away from the trucks as I could be comfortably, I sat and waited and the sun rose and the sun rose across that desert and on a on a pillow of clouds seemed to be mine alone and and that sun gave to me i think uh the permission the acknowledgement that any anything is possible and we simply need to seize the opportunity and uh, and turn to it and use use that opportunity. And I came back different from that experience and from that desert and from that continent, uh, more ready to, uh, I think, to seize opportunities. And so on the next slide, you can, you can see that uh, I find myself born in the 50s, a child of the 60s, uh, out of Southwestern Ontario. And uh, although I am white, middle class and old, I love the outdoors and I am open to learning and sharing and discovering new things. Um, I sometimes need to be pointed clearly at things. I'm, I'm not always astute, uh, but I am optimistic and I believe that we can make a difference together. We can, we're not alone. And on the next slide, you'll see that uh, I could reference all of my journeys and, and to wonderful places, to, to groups that are doing amazing things. And if you want to see my travel logs at any point, please let me know. Uh, but uh, whether it's the Green School in Bali uh, or youth conferences on the environment in Singapore, uh, government-sponsored camp education uh, in Russia, youth adventure tours to the North Pole, uh, in Nigeria, they are restoring ag agricultural, lost agricultural schools to, to youth uh, who need to turn uh, and work the land again. It's all part of a big picture, and we are part of that big picture. And uh, there, are, there are some differences in, in those places, but by and large, we, are, uh, we have much in common. And, we, and the people that are passionate about it are doing many of the same things. So it's great that we can share ideas and should. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I'd like to reference things a little closer to home uh, for the rest of this conversation. So I'd like to touch back to some learnings from our First Nations and uh, that'll take us to the next slide where uh, it's always fun, isn't it, to, to have things from one point in your life, connect to other parts in your life. And, and we can go back to, or I can go back to my years in, in psych and at university and, and remember the hierarchy of needs and trying to memorize them. Uh, but it, it's lately I've discovered that Maslow actually spent some time among the Blackfoot Nation uh, in Western Canada. And Cindy Blackstock, the University of Alberta professor, uh, uh, and also a member of the Gitscan First Nation, uh, wrote an article and, and touched on some things that Maslow maybe missed. Uh, and in the discussion of, of moving people through their basic needs to a higher level, to a level of self-actualization as a peak, um, she suggested that there, that really is a beginning, that we help every individual get to a good place, but, but that just prepares them to be part of a greater actualization, the actualization of community and a thing that she called cultural perpetuity. The Gitscan Nation calls it the breath of life, that connection not just with us within community, but the community within the context of multiple generations. We can all touch on, on and know that we need to 
plan for the seventh generation, but it's, it's really interesting to see that uh, here in this context. The, the sketch to the right uh, leads me to uh, see Maslow also in a different way, that, that if a child is complete, they need all of these things, but they don't need them in sequence. They need them as part of a network. And it is that network connection of growth that leads us on to, uh, to a, a complete individual and that complete individual within the context of their community and that community within a context of the culture and of the world. Our next slide is a, is a slide that I've, I've pulled from other conversations that I've had and it reinforces this idea that, that we, what we want to do is connect. We want to help kids connect to all aspects of their environment. They need to see one another in different light. They need to connect with adults uh, and the wider world in, a, in, a, in an effective way, that the outdoor connection is key, and also that connection with the inner voice. Uh, and to my way of thinking today and in uh, especially, uh, that inner voice is an important one. It's very important for us to help with, with youth engagement if they can not only hear what's, what's being said, but also hear what's being felt and the, the feelings inside an individual, that voice in the light of all of the social media and mass media that's going on, the voice that is the true voice for a child has to be the one from within. And that's the one that we really want to cultivate. Onward to an overview, and uh, we're already running a little late, so I hope that we can uh, touch on these things in an effective way in the next few minutes. I'd like to discuss the relationship between wisdom and knowledge and experience. I'd like to, to uh, draw on the words of uh, a mentor of mine, uh, to know, to care, and to act, uh, and then encourage us to take an environmental step, small, large, that we must move forward. So my equation is that wisdom equals knowledge and experience. And educational philosophers have been talking about this for centuries, uh, that it is one thing to simply have the information poured into the vessel that is each of us, uh, but it, until we can experience something, and apply it to who we are and who we understand ourselves to be and mesh knowledge and experience in an effective way, we don't become wise. We often associate wisdom with, with the elderly. Uh, my wife can confirm that I am, haven't reached, achieved that yet. Uh, but, but our obje object here is to help children become wise as at the youngest age possible. At the, at the earliest opportunity to, to let them nurture and, and develop their knowledge and experience into that solid inner voice that can speak clearly to them. Onwards. None of this will be new to any of you as I look at names that I see on the screen, and I'm sure the reason that you're here is because you are educators. And so, so we know that what we want to do is to help children get beyond themselves, to be more aware of the world around them, uh, and also to be encouraged to take that step, to look, to try, to, to, to fail if, if, if uh, necessary, and, but to rise again and to, and to act again. And so, our education, in my view, needs to be incremental. That is to say, it needs to meet the needs of the child at the time. It needs to be intentional. So educators guide and create the, the world in which those experiences take place. And as we encourage kids to step to the edge to, of what they know and what's comfortable, then the unpredictability of the outcome is the energizing factor. Uh, will we succeed? Will we not succeed in our efforts? And it is that that is the learning edge, the, the place that guides uh, 
educators and students to try and try again. That, that, and it's in that learning that learning becomes exciting, that learning becomes interesting, and it becomes a reinforcing, a self-perpetuating approach to life. That can be seen on our next slide that, that uh, draws on the, the wisdom spiral, the learning spiral, the experiential spiral, uh, that experiential education model draws heavily on, first of all, preparing our kids to, to participate in an activity, preparing them physically and intellectually and emotionally, and that once that's in place, then the experience can unfold. Uh, the educator can, can help create the experience in which the child finds themselves. And then that unfolds as it must do and with the unpredictability that an experience like this creates. And that then following that experience time, and this is the key piece, and this is the thing that separates camp for fun and camp for purpose. Uh, and uh, that, that some opportunity to, to look back and just to say what happened and, and, and what else was going on there and, and what, what, what does it mean? What, what can I gain from that experience? What can I draw from that experience? Is the reflection time that I think we must allow children to experience. And it's through that that we gain that they gain some links and some connections. They expand that safe zone um, to, to go to the next level uh, and to then want to try again. And it informs them in how and how to approach that next step up a wisdom spiral. So educators don't solve problems. They don't, they don't lecture or preach, they create them. Uh, and, and as we, as those experiences or problems uh, are managed, uh, then the wisdom grows and we can draw children to other messages and allow them to discover. As I mentioned, one of my mentors uh, carried this byline uh, to know, to care, and to act. Kirk Whipper, many of you will know. Uh, he was an educator, and you can see him uh, uh, in, still alive, I think, in the Canadian Canoe Museum. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll advance the slide, please. Uh, and we can, he was an educator with the Toronto, or pardon me, the University of Toronto, physical education, but also a camp director, the founder of the first canoe school, woodsmanship schools in Canada. And I think, uh, was first and foremost an environmentalist. Uh, and uh, his belief, and he took every opportunity to, to uh, lecture to us all uh, that, uh, that we cannot create effective actors until we help them understand and care about the thing that they are acting to, uh, to preserve. And you can't love until you care. Uh, and the corollary of that is you can't ignore what you love. So surely our message is we've got to help kids love the out of doors and love being in the out of doors and love what it is that the out of doors gives them. Uh, helping them do that, not by, not by lecture, but by, by real experience. On the next slide, you can see that I've, uh, I've, I'm going to divert just a, just a slight bit because I want to I want to ensure that we are all on the same page around one another aspect of caring and that is that we need to care of not just about the environment but also care about the kids and and they need to feel that and they need to they need to know that you care in order to comfortably participate in in what it is that we that we are offering as educators uh, and Without that, anything else that we do is not going to be effective. We cannot create uh, urgency in a child unless we too are committed to, to that child. And, and so that is a key element before we proceed. Onward. I'm going to draw on another uh, 
another mentor of mine, uh, Claire McGee, years and years ago, um, touched on this baseball analogy, and, and it it's still it's still it's still with me today. And it, I, I want to I want to just uh, reinforce or at least reference the fact that like the the um, a reinterpretation of Maslow this is more of a network than it is a sequence of first base, second base, third base, but we will do that nonetheless. So our destination is clear. We want to get our home base is environmental health uh, through environmental action. Uh, and uh, our players are the youth that are in our care. So let's uh, advance to first base. So one element of what we are doing here is that the experience overall is fun. It's positive. It re it's, it, it uh, uh, all the all the uh, pheromones are not pheromones. All the uh, uh, all of the chemical releases in our uh, in the experience need to be part of uh, what's going on in order to keep kids engaged. Uh, at our camp, we have a. We have a nature department and a nature program that forms one quarter of our overall skills instruction program, and kids love it. There are games that are intentional uh, in their in their structure and choices, uh, but they are engaging at a uh, at a physical and an emotional level as well as an intellectual level. Uh, many of us uh, play the survival game at our camp, and, and I just want to reach back to Frank Glue, who was an earlier influence on me, uh, who developed not the survival game, but a program he called Instincts for Survival, uh, a, a game in which students and children could participate and balance the fun aspect of tag in the forest with the learning components that are sometimes missed in the follow-up to these and other games and activities. Touching on, on biology, um, mating, pollution, statistics, um, uh, uh, emotional connections, uh, art and drama, all of these things come out of the, the, the game, if you will. And that is the intentionality that we want to achieve in providing fun, positive experiences in the other doors. Getting to second base, well, it is that emotional level, uh, the feelings. We want to encourage kids to listen to their voice, to look inside, to, to, to realize how the environment touches them. Uh, and it does touch them at all levels and in all kinds of different ways. And we can do it in different ways. I've, I've referenced here uh, the work of Andy Goldsworthy, um, and uh, uh, I was picked up at a, at a conference uh, just how it is that we can in, encourage children to participate in a similar way. Andy works with the out of doors with natural materials in order to, uh, to express his own uh, art and, and emotion in nature, and so too can children. At different age levels, it may be as simplistic as a, as a tree, um, or it may be something more complex. And from that, we can move to poetry and journaling and, uh, and, and establishing connections with the, with the out of doors. So fun and feelings, here we go. So at some point in here, and again, if this is not sequential, uh, then the facts can come in. I will say that I, that I disagree with the idea that facts sits on first base, and it's the reason I've moved it over to third, uh, that, that we need to engage first uh, and in a positive way, and that some of our messages around facts can be, um, what shall I say, uh, uh, discouraging. Uh, and what we want to do is to guide people, uh, our children, in a positive way. And we need to get there for sure. Uh, but I believe that education is not a lecture. It's a discovery. And uh, that discovery implies that, that we are the first 
to to arrive someplace. Uh, um, the the Vikings to North America, the indigenous people to North America, uh, Columbus to North America, each in their own way discovered uh, the uh, the beauty of this uh, this land. Uh, so we too we don't want to drag kids to a fact. We want to allow them to discover and that can be done by encouraging them to look with their real eyes. And, and uh, in this case, I've referenced the, the Roberta Bondar program uh, and what it has done to bring kids to nature in a different way, to give them a different eye uh, through a lens, a different perspective, to give them skills, uh, and also to encourage them to go beyond simply taking the photo to, and to, to asking the questions of why. So fun facts and feelings, uh, and how do we get there? Let's, uh, this, is, uh, this is back to Kirk, uh, to know and to care and to act and to what it is that education in the out of doors really is. Uh, and Kirk's wild walks were, were famous. People would, would leave everything else in order to, to follow. Kirk into the woods and just to hear him uh, and to help uh, uh, him embrace the world around uh, around us and it was a it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Donaldson and Donaldson and I'm, I'm reaching way back to the 50s and 60s uh, tried to define outdoor education as education in, for, and about the out of doors. Uh, but over the years, I've, I've added one more proposition, and it's my belief that, uh, that outdoor education is education also through the out of doors, that this preposition, I think, is probably the most important, that nature is our teacher, nature is our guide, nature is our guru, and if we can simply help people connect to nature, then all of the rest follows along behind. People want to be out of doors. People want to care about the out of doors. They want to learn about the out of doors. Let the out of doors connect with them. Onward. So we're left with engagement. Uh, how do we get to environmental action? What do we do to, to bring kids to a, a sense of curiosity, to develop ways of discovering, to, to develop ways of participating and accepting the challenge. Uh, I said earlier that, uh, that uh, our urgency uh, is not our youth's urgency. Uh, they can quite rightly say that your urgency is not my problem, uh, but then I think that it's fair to say, because we have some experience, to say that they, what they really mean is that your urgency is not my problem yet. And, and the, the yet is the thing. We need to uh, allow children to come to that place, to get to that spot where their urgency is in fact the same as our urgency. Uh, and we, we can't do that by preaching. We have to do it by engaging. So on the next slide, it's, it's, it is an invitation for us to, to, take, the, to take the steps um, and, and to figure out how to take the steps. Uh, how do we move forward to an eco health uh, and away from eco oblivion? Uh, it's fair to ask why, why do we fail to act in so many times and in so many places? The excuses are, are commonplace and they're all familiar to you. You know, uh, we don't have all the information. Uh, there might be another way. Uh, it's, it's not relevant to me. It doesn't really affect me. Uh, it's, it's all too big and I can't make a difference. Uh, so there are all of these problems exist in front of us and all of these challenges but also all of these opportunities. And each of us finds us finds ourselves somewhere on this step staircase. Uh, and none of us are at the top 
uh, and, and we won't be there for a long time. But we all have a role because we are all part of the, the movement to reach down and to pull people, to encourage people up to our step, our step and our level and our understanding, and also to reach up and to seek out uh, those that can help improve our actions and our understandings. And, and so everybody is a player in this. We, and every child is a player in this. And so we want to help them uh, figure out that every step is important. The, the eco health eco oblivion is actually part of a game that we play at at camp with some of our senior campers, uh, and it involves. I, in fact, I, we were going to. I was going to suggest playing it today, but I ran out of figuring out how to do it. Uh, but we got some volunteers, and those are the little X's along the the line, somewhere between eco health and eco oblivion. And as and these five volunteers stand there, and we feed them. We actually hand them some cards uh, that they read out. Uh, that represent actions that they they are taking. And on the next slide, you can see some of those cards. So, so a person is given the card and they're asked to read the card uh, and the jury, the rest of the group, listens very carefully as adjudicators. Uh, and so following the the reading of the action, uh, the moderator would then invite the, the jury, based on what's been read, to uh, to do the thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, one thumb up uh, if it's good, uh, two thumbs up if it's really good, a thumb down uh, or two thumbs down, or a thumb up and a thumb down if it's good and bad. Uh, so based on that kind of instant poll, then the moderator invites the group to comment, I see your thumb went down, I see your thumb went up, what, let's talk about this and, and why do you feel and uh, the way you do. And based on all of that, then uh, the moderator and the, and the jury agree that that individual would be stepping back towards oblivion, sliding back towards oblivion or stepping forward towards eco health. Um, here are a couple that I, didn't put up. We had an all day camp lecture on environmental awareness. So you could thumb up or thumb down based on that. Some good, some not so good. This morning canoe instruction, instead of doing strokes, we paddled across the lake to observe a beaver's colony working on building a dam. Uh, today I hired David Suzuki and Richard Louf. They are co-directors of our water skiing program. And so we could debate the merits of that. So we all need to think about what steps we can do and how we can make a difference. Every slideshow needs a sunset shot and allows me to say that uh, we, number one, need to be intentional and we need to create experiences that allow for discovery and allow children to reach their own conclusions and uh, to discover what it is that's going on inside them. And that is the effect that we can have uh, on the environmental health in the community at large. On the final slide, it is, I said, I'm an optimist and I believe that we, we can make a difference and we, uh, we simply need to make an effort. And uh, I applaud everybody who's here, particularly Joss who has led the way on creation of this uh, symposium and uh, the Near North Center. Uh, and it is uh, important that we find ways to make that difference uh, in our own lives, in the lives of people that are around us. Thank you for this. I hope it was helpful. And again, I'm available. To do is continue to thrive and adapt to all these new challenges that were surely are coming our way.